Let's see. We can you hear me? Okay, I'm here. Okay, great. And let me turn my video on. All right, looks like it's working. We can see you and we can hear you. Do you need help with the slides? Um, I am just about to get my screen going here. Great, we can see it. All right. All right, so thank you everyone for joining me. This is the very first time I've done a COEB presentation by webinar and I'm very excited to share my presentation. Um, like I said in my introduction, I've been teaching iBEST for six years and it was definitely something that when I saw it coming along all those years ago, I realized that it was something really new in adult ed and you know, prior to that, I'd been an adult ed for 14 years, and I just, I knew that IBEST was going to be something that was going to make a big difference in the lives of my students, and I actually could not have imagined the impact that it that it did have. Just watching students who succeed and, and come through our IBEST programs, it's absolutely amazing. And what we've really noticed is that students just they seem to do so well in iBEST. Our graduation rate in our iBEST class is also often 90% or above, which kind of compares to our traditionally enrolled classes. Our graduation rate for those classes can typically be about 22%. So iBEST makes a big difference for students. And so a few years ago, I was enrolled in the Leadership Excellence Academy. And as part of that, we looked at continuous program improvement and things that we could do to make our program better and things that we could do differently. And so I kind of sat down and looked at my data from our iBEST program and really thought about what it was that made iBEST different. And one thing that I took away from that was that there was a lot that we do in iBEST that really um, is beneficial for students, but that it doesn't necessarily be, need to be unique to iBEST. And the, there were components that I saw that we can easily replicate in our traditionally enrolled classrooms that don't cost anything or very little more, but that they, they, they pay back tenfold um, at the time that you implement them from students. So I just kind of want to walk through some of the, some of the things that we saw in some of the things that we have implemented in our program that really were born out of our, our, in our iBEST program. So for me, the first thing that I always look at is how do adults learn? This research is as old as the hills. It's probably as old as me. And yet every time I read it, I take something away from it. And it really forces me to ground what I do in my teaching to how adults learn. And another part of it that always makes me think is that I am also an adult and this is how I learn too. So I think that this, this part is really, really connected to iBEST. And some Sometimes in the adult education classroom, we move away from so many of these things, but this very basic research nowadays is still so relevant. So I always think that this is something that we really need to connect our classes to. Adult learning is self-directed. Our adult learners, they know what they need to know. Um, they, they know where they are in life. They know where they need to go. And, and IBEST programs help adult learners really get onto a track and get onto a career pathway. Um, in our classrooms, we really try to work around things that adults already know. We try to empower adults to come in as instructors almost and to show us what they learn. Um, IBEST really sets a goal for our adult learners. It's very relevant. All of our, con all of our instruction in IBEST is contextualized to what adult learners need to know. Um, Adult learning highlights practicality. We embed a, a practical learning experience into our IBEST program. So that's something that we take away from that into our traditionally enrolled programs as well. And really, I think this last one for me is probably the biggest thing that comes out of IBEST is that it encourages collaboration. And that has been something that has completely transformed my classroom in how I look at my role as an instructor and the student's role as learners. That collaboration piece has really changed for me. So IBEST, for those of you who don't know or are new to the planet, is a special type of IET. It's Integrated Basic Education and Skills Training. So it's a very specific IET. 
which is integrated education and training. So we're really looking at incorporating and embedding workforce activities into our educational piece. The thing that makes IBEST different is that it is a specific cohort. So everybody in the class is working for the same goal at the same time. And in IET, you don't necessarily have that. You can have some learners working towards one goal, other learners working towards something else. So IBEST is very, very specific. And it was born in 2004 in Washington State and began with 10 pilot classrooms. And it really challenged the traditional belief that students had to go through all of their basic education training, first of all, in order to be able to be successful in an adult, in a, in a workforce training piece. So I know back in the day, maybe 15 years ago, we would have students who would come in who would be basic skills deficient or who didn't have their high school diploma or their GED. And we would make them work on that piece, first of all and it would just take students so long to work through that they would get discouraged they would they would drop out of class they would they would stop out they would just not come anymore and it, it was a really long piece when you would have to tell somebody you know you need to go from a fifth grade educational level all the way up to 12th grade before I can help you get into a training so definitely it changed some things up and just challenged that notion that students needed to succeed as adult learners first before they could succeed in a skills training. And the goal in IBEST is to have your, gla your class rec um, receive a, an industry recognized credential. So we really want them to get into those family sustaining wage paying jobs right off the bat and get them into those more quickly than a traditionally enrolled student. So this was a slide that I saw a long time ago um, down in Pima Community College. Laurie Kirstad, Joseph and Wendy Schrader Black have been doing iBest for a long time. They do it really, really well. And this to me is just a great visual of what makes iBest different from our traditional instructional model. So if you look here, usually our basic skills classes take a long time. It gets students up to the point where they can pass GED. Then they have a long time in an occupational certificate training, and then they finally get into that family sustaining wage career. The thing about IBEST that's nice is that they're doing both at once. They're mixing those basic skills um, classes and the occupational certificate. They get their GED often before they finished with the occupational certificate, and then they have that longer time in a family sustaining wage career and then underneath that we build a lot of support so it's definitely a challenge for students IBEST is really upping their game it is a challenge for people to go back to college and do their GED at the same time so we really want to support them as best we can we do that as much as we can I work at a community-based organization so we have nice wraparound services we can often provide food boxes and um, we have a program where we can help out with utilities or rental assistance Assistance. So we have a, we have a lot of different supports that we can build in for students that really help them to be successful in this model. And my screen has just frozen. Let me see if I can get it to move on. I cannot. Any ideas on how to get my screen to move? So I'm here for you, Heather, um, and you're pushing and it's just not moving forward. Yeah, it's not going. I actually don't have any control over my screen at all. It's taken on a life of its own. Let me see if I can help you here. Okay, oops. Okay, do you want to try one more time? Sure. So far, so good. Keep your fingers crossed. Okay. All right, let me see. I think it just skipped ahead because I was clicking and clicking and clicking. Okay, great. All right, here we go. Hopefully this works. No, nope, it wants to get stuck on this slide. Oh, hold on. It looks like it's just working on something, so maybe it'll go in a second. Maybe you can do that one more time and see if it'll pull it back in. Okay, hold on one second here. All right. Okay. 
All right, maybe I should go slower. It definitely doesn't like that one slide. Okay, cool. So when we look at why would we not do IBEST, because it's this amazing program and it benefits everybody, the downside to it is that it is expensive. It is a big investment per student. We spend a lot more on an IBEST enrolled student than we do on a traditionally enrolled student. So of course, in adult ed, funding is always an issue. We're always looking at how, how many resources we have and how best to leverage those resources. We want to be able to serve as many students as possible, and we want them all to be successful. So a lot of times, iBEST just won't work for your program because it is too expensive. You might have a class who don't have high enough TAB reading levels. That I have found to be key for success in iBEST. I will often take a student who maybe has a second grade math TAB level and I'm happy to put them into an IBEST program if their reading level is high enough and they tend to do very well. But if your students' reading levels are slow, low to begin with, they are going to really struggle in, in an IBEST classroom. So definitely not a good fit for, for a lower le reading level student to put them into an IBEST um, classroom. And then maybe you just have a small program or, or you just have a bunch of students and they don't, wanna, they don't have the same professional goals. You have some who want to work in construction, somebody else who wants to be a medical you are not going to force all those students to go on the same um, career pathway so you, you know at that point you would be unable to form a class and then the other thing that really is a big issue for us in Metro Phoenix is fingerprint and background clearance issues. So a lot of the IBEST programs that we tend towards are medical because that is a big employment um, factor for students around here right now. So those students really need to be coming in with a clear background. And if we have students who've got any kind of issues with their background checks, they are not gonna be able to be in an IBEST classroom. So we're looking for those students to be in another um, classroom that is also a good fit for them. Oops. I'm getting trigger happy. So what iBEST really shows us is that learning communities are a great way for students to learn. And this is something that changed my mentality of how I felt about being in my classroom, working in, in an iBEST classroom. This was something that I really took away and now implement in my traditionally enrolled classrooms as well. This part, adult learners thrive in collaborative relationships with their educators, helped me to change my mindset where I looked at me as being part of a learning community with my students rather than me being the lead of the learning community. And I think that when you can create a positive learning environment, your students feel so much more empowered to persist. Um, you're still gonna have students who are challenged, you're still gonna have students who struggle with material, but when you, can, when you can build a learning community, it is just so beneficial for your students. And iBEST really helps us see how well those learning communities work for us. Learning communities, they set goals. You go back to Knowles, that's how he tells us how adults learn. Their learning is goal oriented. So in a learning community, you've really got that goal. They're very empowering for the learner to participate in because you've got an instructor who's working with students, modeling how to learn, but also giving students and learners that opportunity to become instructors. So a lot of times in a learning community, I move myself all the way to the back of the room and I let my students take the lead. If I've got one student, who brings in expertise that they have that they already know how to do this then I'll turn it over to them and I'll let them teach that content and show everybody else how to do it so um, very empowering for, for adult learners to be in that kind of learning community we also make mistakes we we are all working together it is perfectly fine to make mistakes we actually try to embrace mistakes and that is that is a big thing for adult learners because so many of my learners particularly with math come in with the idea that they failed at math in school they are not good at math they can't do it or else they do it wrong and so in a learning community we see that students really have time to make mistakes and then they have time to reflect on those mistakes and time to correct them and time to learn how they're going to do it differently the next time so I really want students in a learning community to struggle I believe that that is a big part of learning that you have to you have to make your brain work to be able to learn efficiently and effectively and in a, in a learning community it's just so cool to see you know 
that eureka moment that students often have whenever they've really worked at something and they finally realize how they can go about doing it better. I love learning communities because it really helps me build my instruction. So I will, I'll do instruction typically over a three hour period and then have my students stay for a learning community after that. And it helps me see what they took away from my instruction, what I need to do differently, how I need to change things out. Um, a learning community also brings the, um, the diverse expressions of competency and expertise and for us, um, particularly in Arizona, we've really been working on trying to implement universal design for learning into our classrooms and I want to be able to embrace those diverse expressions of competency. I want students to be able to show me five different ways that they've mastered the material. So um, I really like to do that through a learning community. And then they start in a classroom but they really extend beyond. Our goal for our learners is not that they are going to stop learning the second they walk out our door. We really want our students to become lifelong learners and take away all of the all of the um, factors that they learn about learning through them with them through the rest of their lives. So we have to facilitate learning communities. They don't usually start organically. There's something that we, we have to work on and we have to work with students to be able to make them happen. So the first thing we really do with students is we encourage them to set aside the time to learn. We, we talk about being in class for three hours and that's our instruction time, but we also talk about how you need to reflect on what you have been shown in class to actually learn it, learn it and how learning and teaching aren't the same things. So I think for a lot of students, having somebody recognize that is very powerful. If you can tell students, you know, I teach this much in three hours, but you don't learn this much in three hours. So we talk about learning communities as being a very important way to actually learn and reflect on the material that you've covered. We try to build community in our classrooms. We have students work on similar things that interest them. We, we have students who work towards the same goals. We work on project-based learning. There's a lot of group work. And then one thing that we started doing a couple of years ago was really working with puzzles and little riddles and things like that that we would have the class try to work on as a whole. And that really brought learners together. So those are really cool to, to be able to work in your classroom with just things like puzzles and, and different, different riddles. We use social networking for our learning communities. Um, all of our students seem to have iPhones or, or some kind of smartphone. So we set up a text group, WhatsApp, any kind of um, communication that will enable them to call each other and say, hey, why are you not in class? Or I'll pick you up and give you a ride. We provide a space for learning communities to happen. So we have an empty classroom that students can come and hang out there. We will provide spontaneous incentives. Usually we try not to do it on a very regular basis. We try to kind of keep it where students don't know what's going to be there on any particular day. So food and rewards and gift cards and things like that always tend to work well to encourage students to come to learning communities. But really, honestly, once students get into a learning community and they have networked with their peers, they start to enjoy learning and we see that students are much more likely to show up willingly. So we also provide access to support material. For example, they have a smart board or a whiteboard. And I like to take a real hands-off approach because that's when I wanna see what's going on and what students have taken away from their instruction. But I am there just to be supportive. If, if everybody's pulling their hair out, I do not want students to struggle to the point where they give up. So I, I'm there to, to help them through with it, whatever they're working on. What do we do in our learning communities? In our learning communities, we learn how to learn. So I think this is one thing that IBEST really has shown me that is um, very important for adult learners is that a lot of them think that they cannot learn. I hear that all the time. I was no good in school. I, I struggled in school. I was a slow learner in school. Um, I could never do math in school. And so they have missed out on that important piece of learning how to learn. And for me, the reflection from this really came from how I learned as a child. And my dad was big on puzzles and riddles in the car. And every time he drove somewhere, he would have a question that I would have to think about to get the answer and I started to think about how much I enjoyed that kind of thing as a learner and 
decided to try it out with with my um, students and it's actually been really successful so we kind of will do things like this that the top puzzle that you can see on your screen is where students have to find the odd one out and it's it's very challenging because this kind of puzzle really facilitates dialogue with your students where one might say well the green one's the odd one out or somebody else is going to say the circle is the odd one out or somebody will say the one on the far right is the odd one out this puzzle is actually really really clever because the correct answer as it were is the square all the way on the left is the odd one out because it is never the odd one out so um it's it's just one of those puzzles that there's there is i guess technically a right answer but what i'm looking for students to do with this is to be able to defend their argument why do you think the circle is the odd one out you need to tell me you need to explore why why it's the odd one out and why the green one isn't the odd one out so it gives students the opportunity to engage in that dialogue and then to start to discuss with each other where one student will say well it's actually the green one that's the odd one out because it's a different color and somebody else will say well the circle is a different shape so we're starting those dialogues and just getting students into that really Socratic method of learning where you're questioning everything and looking at all the different components and then the second one is just another fun one like which one is the odd one out there so one student might say pig but another student might say hen whereas if you have a, a, a student who's looking at the number of letters they're going to say sheep is the odd one out somebody might say cow is the odd one out because it's the only word where all the letters are in alphabetical order the pig's the only non-kosher animal, the hen is the only bird. So I'm really looking for students to give me their thoughts on this. And I find these to be super successful in classroom in engaging students and just getting people to really start to think. Um, I put some resources into this. I I think that we can do enough of this in our classrooms. We usually just do it as a 10 minute warm up at the start of class for logical and critical thinking. I use Alec Bellos every Monday, every other Monday in The Guardian, um, theguardian.com or theguardian.co.uk. He has a little puzzle. Brilliant.org has a bunch of stuff. So there's just, there's a, there's a few resources in this slide. And I like what it says in Math for Love. Um, the arithmetic in, in a puzzle is the means to the end rather than the end in itself. So it's clear why you need it. So to me, that really it's back to Knowles and that adults do much better when their learning is very purposeful. And puzzles provide a humane way to get a huge amount of arithmetic practice. You know, I, I look at my kids when they came through and they were in lower grades and that brutal, you know, 20 minutes of drilling on math, nobody enjoys that. Whereas if you teach it through a puzzle, it's much more engaging engaging for students and much more fun for people to learn that way. Um, one other component that came from IBEST that we have implemented in some of our classrooms is team teaching. So this to me goes back to building a community of learners. If you have um, team teachers working together, then students can really see themselves as part of a, more of a learning community when it's not just one teacher as the giver of all knowledge and then the student as the recipient. So we try to do team teaching in our classes as much as we can. There is a myth that it's a budget buster, but I will I always will take a larger class with two teachers over one small class with one teacher because I like that diversity that you get with lots of opinions, ideas, experiences. We will often do debate in our team teaching classrooms and we can randomly divide up students so they are responsible. They have to research, they have to put together an argument, they have to be able to defend their argument. Yes. Um, we do a lot of project-based learning whenever we work on team teaching. And I think one of the things for team teaching that is really a great takeaway is that your low level learners who are often not your low level thinkers work with high level readers who are sometimes not the best of high level thinkers. So it really is a more even way of, of having students work together and collaborate. And team teaching is also great for um, universal design for learning because one, student, one teacher can be doing one thing with a group of students while the other one does something else with a different group. So definitely you can differentiate your instruction very nicely if you have a team teaching model. You can give individualized attention when you need to and the instructors model how to learn. So, 
we actually did a survey in a team teaching class um, about a year ago, and I thought it was hilarious that all, everybody who took this, this survey said, when one teacher doesn't know the answer, the other teacher will step in to help them. And I was like, well, we've been modeling that for you, but apparently we're very convincing because you think that we don't know what we're doing. And then some resources for team teaching. WorldEd.org has a fabulous free self-paced course. It goes over the six, me six methods of team teaching. You can do it online in three hours. Um, the other thing that I would recommend is to watch a team talk class in person. I have team taught with several people and I think even a bad team teaching experience there is something positive that you can take away from that. So the very first team teaching experience I had, I definitely did not agree with the person with whom I team taught. But out of everything that I took away from that class, he showed me how to be a much more patient instructor than I had ever been in the past. So every time I've taught in a team taught classroom, I have learned something, whether it's about myself or whether it's about my students or how to be a better teacher. I just think it's, it's a great takeaway. And to me, students really enjoy being in a team taught classroom. Um, my screen has frozen up again. Sharon, can I get you to help me out? Yeah. Yep, I'm here. I guess I can stop sharing and we can go <laughs> do, <laughs> do that again. Sure. Okay, give me one second here. Okay. While you're doing that, I'm just going to mention there are people who are putting comments in the chat box. Please go ahead and put those right in the Q&A. That'll be easier for Heather to get to those at the end. Okay, I'm one, I'm one screen too far and I don't, let me see if I can get it to the back. Oh, here we go. Okay. So I just put this in as a quick recap of types of team teaching. Um, there's the traditional method where you have one instructor introduces content and the other one provides support for the instructor. I personally find that to be the most boring form of team teaching and my favorite is totally a collaborative team teaching model. It is more difficult to do, but I think that students get a lot more out of it and it definitely lends itself a lot more to the idea that we are a community of learners. So there's just some examples of team teaching here that if you have never team taught or you've never read up on it, this is a great resource. And these ideas come from worleded.org. So you can do parallel instruction, two smaller classes, same content. Um, I do not like that. I've always found it to kind of defeat the purpose of team teaching, um, but definitely it depends on your learners and your program and, and what your needs are for your learners. So you could have a look at those. Um, IBEST also tells us that we should contextualize our instruction and I think this has been a huge takeaway for me to start to see that adult learners really learn best from real life experiences. Um, I had read that in Noel's research over and over again about how we learn and how adults learn and they learn from real life but it was only when we really started to do um, contextualized instruction that I saw how much more effective and efficient it was for our learners. So I I try to teach my math out of Empower math books because they're all they all relate to real life and I think that is was very empowering for um, my students to start to see that there were parts of math the, the math curriculum that they were they actually knew how to do and they mastered but when we worked in a traditional textbook they they felt lost and they just felt like they had a long way to go whereas when you when you bring it back to real life and show students when you already do that you know when you do your grocery shopping or when you take your kids to the doctor this is something that you already and you know how to figure out. Um, it, it really helps students to see that that they they're not just in they don't just have to memorize and they're going that mile deep, not a mile wide. So really great for student understanding. And this I this is the last slide that I have, but it is by no means the least. So 
When we started iBEST, our state set a goal of 100% um, graduation for our iBEST students. And I had been teaching probably at that stage for about 14 years, and I knew that I could not get 100% of my students to graduate. And on when I reflect on that now, um, it actually makes me so sad for my students that I taught before I started to do iBEST because I didn't think they could and of course they're going to feed on that and they're not going to think that they can either. So the goal, setting a goal of 100% completion for iBEST was a complete game changer for me. It made me up my game. I was invested in those students. I texted them every single day, multiple times. I phoned them all the time. I formed more of a bond with students than I'd ever formed before. I was really invested in being part of their learning community. And I made much more of an emotional investment, I think, than I have ever made before in my teaching, in that my success was very determined by their success. And that IBEST cohort out of the 14 students that participated, we only had one student who was not able to complete his GED. He's just missing his math, but he did all the rest of the training. So all of those other students went on to complete their GED, they all have good jobs even the one who didn't complete his ged he has um he works in construction so he still has a pretty decent job but it just is it's very you know empowering for me when i see those students and i see them live their lives on facebook you know where they're working what they're doing some of them are in nursing school one of them just moved to a great job up in portland oregon so um i think that teacher investment I best really showed me that teachers need to invest more in their students. So that was one thing that I feel that we can always do better and do differently. Um, I put this slide up for a while. If you want to contact me, my email address is heather.patterson at friendlyhouse.org. And we're on the web at www.friendlyhouse.org. And then just my contact details are on there as well. So. I am going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Great. And Heather, thank you so much for that. We really appreciate all of this information. Um, I do see that there's two questions. Well, actually, one question and one comment out there in the Q&A. Can you see that as well? Heather? Looks like Heather has- Yeah, I guess my audio was a little bit off. So can I just, can I just answer with um, speak? Yeah, I can, I'll send out a copy of- So it looks like Heather has frozen up here. So I'm just gonna answer yes. Everybody can get a copy of the presentation that's gonna be in our Adult Educators Repository. Um, it, it can also, it'll also be on our website. 